Welcome back to Geology One Processes and Products. In this lecture, we are going to discuss the Earth's interior, in particular the composition and physical characteristics of our planet. Now, how do we know this? Thus far, in spite of science fiction movies, no one has been able to journey to the center of the Earth. We know much about our planet's interior because of earthquake wave behavior. Let's get started. Our planet has an overall density of about 5.5 grams per cubic centimeter, but we know that the densest material is at the core. It's not homogeneous throughout. Instead, we have a heterogeneous planet that is divided into different layers. In the introductory lecture, we talked about the division based on chemical composition as well as a physical division based on wave behavior. We also know that the diameter of our planet is about 12,760 kilometers at the equator. It's not quite a sphere. It's actually a slightly elongated spheroid, an ovoid, but um, in general it's almost a sphere. It's slightly compressed at the poles. Mines, however, when we mine deep into the Earth, only extend to about three kilometers and drill holes have only penetrated to about 12 kilometers below Earth's surface. So again, how do we know what we know about the Earth's interior? How do we study the Earth's interior? Just as a reminder, we have the different chemical divisions of the Earth, the crust, and we have both continental and oceanic crust, the mantle, which is 83% of the volume of the Earth, and we have a core, and we hypothesize that we have an outer core that's liquid and an inner core that's solid. But again, how do we know this? How do we study this without going down to the core to take a look ourselves? If you look in the upper right of that diagram, you also see the physical divisions of the Earth. The lithosphere, composed of the crust and the upper mantle, which is brittle and divided into plates, and the asthenosphere, which is plastic, over which those plates move slowly. Now this drilling rig in northwest Russia was able to penetrate 12 uh, kilometers into the Earth's crust, but this is only a very, very small fraction of Earth's total depth. Earth's interior is postulated through that primary and secondary wave behavior. The waves or bents are refracted as they travel from, from one material to another if the materials have different densities. Uh, we can also see some wave reflection as well when waves encounter a, a boundary of a new material. The wave velocity will increase with an increased density. Waves travel fastest in solids. Um, although we project, we have audio by speaking through the air. The sound waves travel from my voice, uh, my mouth, through the air. They're picked up by a microphone. Sound travels much faster. Waves travel faster in solid material. And this makes sense when you think about the compaction or the, uh, the close proximity of molecules in a solid versus a liquid. In a liquid, they're farther apart. In, uh, in a gas, they're even farther apart. So s the waves will travel fastest when we look at dense materials and waves can be reflected at boundaries as well as being refracted. Let's take a look at that. Here we have sort of a cross section of um, a, a diagram of our planet and we have an earthquake rupture. The focus is over there on the left of that, that earth. Note what happens to the waves as they travel through the mantle and then into the, um, the core. If the wave approaches exactly perpendicular to the new medium, it will go straight through. If it approaches at an angle, however, it is going to be refracted or bent. Um, and you can also see that we have some reflected waves as well. As uh, waves hit that new surface, some of that energy is reflected back toward the surface. 
changes in velocity as these waves move from one area, uh, one material with a different density to a, a newer material, um, these changes in velocity mark what are known as discontinuities. The MOHO is a famous discontinuity between crust and mantle as discovered by a Russian scientist, Mohorovicic. And here we go. Here we see, um, for example, look what happens in that bottom diagram, that bottom graph. What happens to the S waves at about 3,000 kilometers? Um, they don't transmit any further. We're going to take a look um, a little bit later at that, why that occurs. But here is a low velocity area pretty close to the Earth's surface. This is a discontinuity. We're changing velocity as the waves move from one medium to another medium with a different density. There's that uh, drop off in the S wave and we're going to investigate that later in this video lecture. So if we look at continental versus oceanic crust, that outer skin of our planet, uh, the continental density is about 2.7 grams per cubic centimeter. Of course, there's a lot of variation. It's not homogeneous. But on average, we can say about 2.7 grams per centimeter. It is granitic, meaning that it is uh, felsic. It's lighter dense density of minerals. It's usually lighter in color. And, and on average, the continental crust is 35 kilometers thick. So it's pretty darn thick. Um, it can range anywhere from about 20 kilometers to about 90 kilometers. As you might imagine, Mount Everest and its roots um, are going to be a lot more crust than, let's say, right along the Atlantic seaboard. But on average, we're looking at about 35 kilometers in thickness. If we compare that with oceanic crust, oceanic crust is denser. It's 3 grams per cubic centimeter. It is basaltic. It's made of more mafic minerals that have higher density. And it's much thinner. Um, not 35 kilometers on average, but only about 5 to 10 kilometers thick. And you may recall from plate tectonics that the ocean crust is usually uh, a lot younger than continental crust. Continental crust can range up to about 4 billion years, whereas oceanic crust is only about 180 million years or younger. The crust mantle boundary, as we move from the surface of the earth through the crust into the mantle, that crust mantle boundary is marked by the MOHO, uh, this discontinuity that's about 30 kilometers below the surface of the earth. And waves are going to speed up and travel faster through the mantle. Now why do you suspect that? Why do waves speed up? What was noted by Mohorovicic was that earthquake generated waves would travel to the seismic stations but those waves that were deeper that were traveling through the mantle actually arrived at the seismic stations first this was a discontinuity remember waves travel faster in denser materials so it makes perfect sense that we have a dense denser material in the mantle, it has a higher density than the continental, uh, or than the crust, and therefore the waves speed up. And there you see that little orange line in the, um, the third little column from the top. There we have a change in wave velocity. The mantle is 83% of Earth's volume. We only can observe it directly at seafloor fractures, and only recently have we been able to do so. The mantle has a low velocity zone, about 100 kilometers below the surface, and this is the asthenosphere where rocks are close to the melting temperature. Again, why do we have that low velocity zone? Well, if rocks are close to the melting temperature, this is looking more like a liquid and waves travel faster in solids than they do in liquids. So it makes sense that the waves are traveling very quickly when they move through solid dense material but when they hit this zone 100 kilometers below the surface where rocks are close to a melting temperature they're going to slow down. We'll get this low velocity zone. Scientists hypothesize that peridotite is the mineral of the mantle. Um, actually, it's more than a hypothesis. It's supported by, by several 
lines of data, including um, peridotite is found in ophiolites, are those uh, sections, oceanic slices that are welded to continents during subduction. You get the mantle, and then you get the uh, gabbro, and the um, sheeted dikes, and pillow lava, and deep sea sediments. Well, the mantle component is peridotite when we look at these ophiolites that are in place during subduction on continental edges. Peridotite is also found in kimberlite pipes as inclusions. And kimberlite pipes are these igneous intrusions that originate deep within the mantle. Let's take a look at that. Here we have a graph that shows us um, at 410 kilometers the velocity increases because of changes in the mineral structure. Uh, that's a transition zone, but at uh, let's move further back toward the axis we have a low velocity zone and that is the uh, uh, partial melting. We have different variations because of partial melting in the asthenosphere. At 660 kilometers um, below the surface, minerals break down into metal oxides and the velocity will again increase. So why do we think it's peridotite? Here we have a diagrammatic representation of a kimberlite pipe. Um, what's neat about kimberlite, it does originate, it's a magma deep within the earth and in addition to bringing up inclusions of peridotite, and one reason we suspect peridotite as being the mineral of the mantle, it's the right density, uh, kimberlite pipes are also mined for diamonds. Okay, the core. The core is about 2,900 kilometers below the surface of the Earth, and it's, it comprises about 16.4% of Earth's volume, much, much smaller when compared to the mantle. A geologist who was working in the um, Geological Survey of India, Oldham, noticed that the seismic waves traveling through that mantle core boundary slow significantly. Hmm, what's going on here? Why would the waves travel slower in the core. Remember, denser materials, faster velocity. Let's investigate further with shadow zones. We have what are known as um, P-wave shadow zones and S-wave shadow zones. Remember, P-wave stands for primary waves. This is a push-pull compressional wave, which is always the first to arrive at a seismic station. At the top of the core, of the Earth, P waves are refracted, and this results in a shadow zone where P waves are not detected on the opposite side of the Earth. And then I'll show you a, a representation of that in just a minute. Gutenberg researched the P wave shadow zone, but it was actually Inga Lehmann who postulated that the core was not entirely liquid. Um, Gutenberg hypothesized that perhaps the core was liquid because of the S-wave shadow zone. S-waves do not travel through liquids and S-waves are stopped dead in their tracks at that core mantle boundary. So there is a big S-wave shadow zone on the opposite side of the earth where S-waves are not detected. Let me show you that. This is the P-wave shadow zone and here we have the focus of our earthquake right at the top of this diagram and you can see refraction of the waves as they travel through the earth. Note what happens at that core mantle boundary. We have some pretty serious ref refraction as the wave moves in and we also have some pretty serious refraction as the wave moves out of that core. So we have two P-wave shadow zones from if we look at the focus and we move 103 degrees um, on either side of that focus from 103 degrees to 143 degrees we detect no P waves traveling through the earth from an earthquake. So those are our P wave shadow zones. The S wave shadow zone, remember those shear waves don't travel through liquids and they are stopped dead in their tracks. So 103 degrees from the focus of the earthquake, again, that's up at the top of our diagram, um, that is the S-wave shadow zone. So that is a major shadow zone. Um, S-waves are stopped dead in their tracks. They do not move through the core. And that is the hypothesis that um, the outer core is liquid. That supports that. And if we move back to the, um, the P-wave shadow zone, I'll do that in just one sec. 
there we go. Note um, what happens to the refraction of the P waves uh, as they enter the core and as they leave the core and also the behavior of those P waves as they move straight through the solid um, inner core as well as the outer liquid core. So Lehman was the one who put that together and noted that perhaps um, the core was not entirely liquid. It is the data support a solid inner core where the pressure is very, very high. Okay, the inner core is solid. The P waves actually increase in velocity when they hit that inner core, which makes sense. It's moving from a uh, liquid area to a solid area, so there's an increase in velocity with denser material. And the density um, is, is great and as such the core is hypothesized to be formed from iron with some nickel. It's not dense enough to be totally iron but um, there is some lightning material and it is suspected that that is nickel. If we look at the outer core, because of the behavior of the S waves, we know that the outer core is liquid because S waves are not transmitted in liquids and they're not transmitted through that outer core. The composition again is iron, but because of the density being lighter than iron, uh, there is some lightning materials as well, including sulfur, um, and it's postulated maybe silicon, oxygen, nickel, and potassium. The sulfur is important because that's going to depress the melting point and as such uh, would more readily rend that outer core to be in the liquid state. What causes the heat of the internal um, earth? We looked at sources in the introductory lecture as being meteorite impacts and gravitational compression and radioactive decay. Well, we don't have as many meteorite impacts, fortunately, today as we did back in Earth's early formation, but we still have residual heat left over uh, from that early formation. Radioactive decay also is ongoing. Uh, we use radioactive decay, radiometric means to date different rocks, and we know that um, we still have radioactive, unstable parents that are decaying to daughters. So radioactive decay is still generating internal heat for the Earth. We can look at the variations in heat flow and this is kind of a really neat diagram if you look at it. Um, note there's an oceanic spreading ridge in that left part and that's where um, of course the magma is coming up, upwelling from uh, deep within the mantle and new crust is being formed but look at what happens to the um, the average flow, that heat flow beyond that spreading ridge you know it, it's lower so we have high heat flow at the spreading ridge and then look at the little right diagram we have the um, the oceanic trench represented as much um, lower heat flow than the world average heat flow now this makes sense think about it remember at o oceanic spreading ridges we hypothesize that the convection cells are ascending remember the convection cells are the mechanism by which the plates are moving uh, over Earth's surface. So at the spreading ridges, the convection cells, the hot limb of that convection cell is moving upwards. It's ascending. So we see that higher heat flow reflected in that oceanic ridge. This is going to result in plate spreading. Now what happens to that cell when it hits the surface and there's cooling? Well, the cold limb of that cell is going to descend and it's at the descending cell that we see the cooler temperature. Where do we hypothesize that convection cells descend back into the mantle? At the subduction zones. So at the trenches, we hypothesize these convection cells that are now cooler are descending and resulting in subduction. So the geothermal gradient that you see here actually supports this hypothesis. Gravity. We know we have gravity anomalies on the Earth's surface. Gravity, of course, results from a body, um, a mass. Um, the pull of gravitational attraction is dependent on mass as well as distance between the, ob the two objects. But we do have anomalies because of either mass excesses, we'll get positive anomalies, or mass deficits, and we'll see uh, negative anomalies in the gravitational record. The anomalies, when mapping was done in India um, at the Himalayas, 
huge anomalies were observed at these large mountains and there wasn't um, a hypothesis, a model in place to explain that but now we suspect that mountains have lower density roots and this is the basis for isostasy. Um, the principle of isostasy was furthered by scientists Airy and Pratt and let's describe what this tells us. The principle of isosity has Earth's crust floating in equilibrium with a denser mantle. And where the crust is thickest, it's going to sink further down into the mantle. So mountains have to have roots to maintain equilibrium. For example, when the surveyors were looking at the Himalayan mountains, they were noticing the deflection of their plumb line. And this can be explained if there is a low density mountain root underneath the mountains. Now remember, it would be low density because we're talking about continental or granitic crust as opposed to basaltic or more mafic minerals that are found in the mantle. The analogy here can be drawn with icebergs. Um, for example, you have these large ice masses floating in, in the ocean, but the root of those icebergs actually extend far beneath the surface. Um, the Titanic swerved to miss an iceberg, but failed to recognize that it, it impacted the part of the iceberg that was below the surface. So large ice masses floating in the ocean actually have greater mass below the surface and the same is true we suspect with our mountains. They have low density roots to keep them in equilibrium with the mantle. So if ice accumulates on the crust as during an ice age, the crust will actually sink further down into the mantle and if that ice later melts, if glaciers melt with a climate warming, then isostatic rebound will occur with the unloading of the crust. We don't have as much mass on the crust, so therefore it should sort of spring back, although a little slowly than we might imagine, um, it'll spring back with isostatic rebound. Here you see the mountain with its low density root in that upper part of the diagram. And then, what happens to mountains that are exposed at Earth's surface? Well, we have weathering and erosion, and sediments are slowly being eroded, carried away, transported away from the top of that mountain, so we're reducing the overall mass at the summit. Look what happens in that middle diagram. We have uplift now, basically the mountains rebounding with the loss of the mass. But what happens as those sediments, those massive amounts of sediments are deposited on either side of the mountain, well those sediments are going to depress the crust in that area as shown in the lower diagram. With glacial ice the same thing occurs. If we have glacial ice, an ice cap, on the crust, it's going to uh, push that crust further down into the mantle for equilibrium. But in times of climate warming, the ice melts. What's going to happen to that crust? There's going to be rebound, isostatic rebound. The process is not rapid, however. Um, this diagram of Scandinavia shows the uplift of the crust in centimeters per century. The uplift is caused by the unloading of the crust after the melting of glaciers during our last ice age. And our as last ice age ended about 10,000 years ago. Finally, let's take a brief look at Earth's magnetic field. Um, it is hypothesized that Earth's magnetic field is caused by a thermal and compositional convection within the liquid outer core. Remember convection cells, same sort of mechanism that fuel plate tectonics but in the mantle. And in addition to these uh, convection cells caused by both temperature and compositional differences in the outer core, we also have Earth's rotation. So Earth's rotation is hypothesized to contribute to Earth's magnetic field as well. And these in combination produce this self-exciting dynamo that generates the magnetic field. 
We also know through the rock record and lava flows on land that the earth has experienced periodic reversals over its history. So we're not exactly sure why this happens or the mechanism behind it, but we do know from the rock record that periodically, though not at predicted intervals, uh, periodically the North and South Pole will reverse. Well, that will conclude this section today on the Earth's interior. Thank you so much for joining me. If any of the aspects of wave behavior sounded a little unfamiliar, you may want to go back to the earthquake video and take a look at that where the different waves were discussed. If you have any questions, please feel free to post them on your discussion board or email your instructor. Thank you so much for joining me, and I'll see you next time.